All right, everyone. Welcome to lecture three. So, yeah, my voice is not really good today, so please bear with me. I think uh, today's lecture will be quite fast. Yeah, I have a, a bit of a Um, yeah, so a bit of a difficulty in the making voice. So I think I'll try to make the uh, lecture brief, although the content itself will be the same. So uh, hopefully we can utilize the, um, the lab session on Thursday to make up for that. But please feel free to ask questions though. So we're gonna cover today we need LSTM token classification and retrieval. All right, so first of all, announcements. So because I canceled last lecture on Thursday and it has been moved to today's lecture. <clears throat> so seven one is now due in two weeks from today. So it's April 5th, 11 p.m. And um, next, next week lecture on Tuesday will be also via Zoom, given the situation that I think will be not wise to, yeah, wise for me to teach this in person for until next week. So again, we're gonna cover um, a few topics today, LSTM, token classification, which also involves question answering and then um, sparse retrieval and dense retrieval. We'll try to go through this without a public break today and make it quick. It's a lot of slides. All right, so let's first talk about the um, long-term dependency. So <clears throat> I think most of you are pretty familiar with this diagram. This is the um, recurrent neural network. Okay. And one of the issues with RNNs is that, well, we talked about the fact that we have to put the activation function here to make it, well, um, nonlinear. But then also it is important to note that the RNs change the entire hidden state at every time step. So it means that it is very difficult to conserve information from a long distance, right? So suppose that you want to convey some information from say x, x t minus 10, then that will be going through, well, 10 layers when you get to uh, the x t. And that 10 layers will transform or make a lot of changes to the input and if you want to conserve some information from that distant location for some reason, because uh, language has a long-term dependency, well, then it becomes quite difficult because uh, it has to go through a lot of um, um, layers, right? So there are several ways to really mitigate this. One is that um, we can use gating mechanism. So this is going to be uh, one of our topics today, LSTM basically. Another is attention mechanism. This is basically giving a, a direct access to a distant token. So this is a future lecture. Actually, we're gonna talk about this uh, mostly in the transformer. And pooling, which also we'll talk about briefly today. I think we talked about this in last lecture too. Maybe this is not um, correct. And residual connection. Well, so this is really common in, um, well, transformer or more modern architecture or uh, in the image domain, but then um, it was not really used in the RNNs. But that's not the only issue with the RNNs. So other issues that gradients might be, might be explode might be exploding or vanishing. And I think I'm pretty sure 
you'll be exploring this in your um, assignment. So the RNA with 10H activation doesn't explode the values. So because 10H always maps any real number to negative one to one, right? Remember this. So this is 10H. So it will not explode the values themselves. So that's fine. But then the issue is now that, well, you, you still can suffer from either exploding or vanishing gradient problem. And what that means is that um, if you take the, well, the, the gradients of this, and then if you, you, you will do, do this for your assignment, but then if you take the gradient of this, and then if you compute the uh, gradient in each time step, then you will see that the, the gradient value will be dependent on the, um, some exponentiation of the parameters. And what that means is that if you exponentiate, exponentiate a parameter to like 10 times or a number of uh, tokens in the sequence, then apparently it will be either very big because that parameter is above one or it will be very small because the parameter is below one. So um, if you do one to the uh, one, one to the two power to the power of 20, for instance, this will be quite big, right? Um, but then if you do 0 0.8 to the power of 20, then this would be very small. So that's the issue because the actual number, the actual parameter might be not too much different. It's either 1.2 or 0 0.8, but then depending on it's below or above zero, uh, above one, because of the exponentiation, it will be basically widely um, um, disparate. Well, <clears throat> there'll be a big disparity between the, the results of the exponentiation, right? <clears throat> okay, so there are several ways to mitigate these exploding or vanishing gradients. And it is possible to mitigate the exploding gradients using gradient clipping. It's actually very easy. We'll talk about this in the next slide. And you can mitigate vanishing gradient using gating mechanism, which is basically the LSTM or GRU. The LSTM is older. It has actually it was proposed in 1997. <clears throat> um, remember that deep learning wasn't really there back then. So it was more of a very theoretical or very um, well conceptual network that they, they proposed. And it actually, people have proven that that's actually quite effective or very useful for many sequential modeling, like only after, um, I would say, at least 15 years later. And around that time, I mean, 15 years later, um, a simpler version of LSTM, which is, there are several actually variations, but GRU is, I think, one of the most popular one because it was used in the um, encoder-decoder network, was proposed in 2014. We'll mostly talk about LSTM though, uh, because um, empirically at the end, people have found that they are not really different. Well, the computation-wise, GRU might be a bit simpler, but then still given the, um, well, the fact that these days, we don't really use these RNNs that as much. Um, I, I, we are just covering LSTMs, but um, maybe briefly jar you. So what is gradient clipping? It's very simple. Actually, it's not just using the RNNs, but it's also used in other, um, fields, especially in the image domain. So it's idea is quite simple. If the gradient is too large, if it's bigger than C, then make it smaller than C. So this is a vector. And then if you um, multiply that by C and then divide that by its norm, what will happen? Well, we know that the norm of this will be one, right? Norm will be one, of course, because you're dividing a vector by a scalar. This is scalar. 
so it will be still vector, but then it will be a unit vector because you're dividing uh, by, by your norm. And then you multiply by C, then the norm of the entire vector will be C. And so you're basically flattening it, right? Um, if it's bigger than C. And actually this is quite useful if the gradient is exploding, not just in the RNNs, but sometimes happens in, the, in other domains too. And it's always actually never bad to really do gradient clipping because anyways, if gradient explodes, then why not clip? And um, if it doesn't explode, then it doesn't affect anything, um, right? I mean, well, if you actually do this, then it still affects the, um, uh, even if this G is actually bigger than C, this will still affect the um, gradient, but then this only applies when the uh, gradient is bigger than C. So the norm is bigger than C. So you have to actually say um, if, yeah, if you have to put this if statement here. All right, so the second mechanism is gating mechanism. And um, I'm going to explain that through LSTM because LSTM is one of the first model that used the gating mechanism. And well, it turns out that this gating mechanism not only helps you to conserve long-term information because we talk about the, that that was the first limitation of the RNNs, the fact that it's not able to handle uh, long-term dependency well, but then also it is also able to mitigate the um, vanishing gradient problem. So this is a quite familiar unit, right? On the left, we know this, right? It's RNN unit. So, um, it's, it might be a different well, way to describe it, but it's actually exactly the same. So you actually have an XT and HT minus one. So it's coming from the previous hidden state and the current input, and they are concatenated. You saw this in your um, lab session last time, right? So it's, it's possible to actually concatenate them and then um, apply some linear and also some not, not, uh, activation function instead of uh, apply linear separately because it's more efficient to actually apply linear just once when you're utilizing especially GPU. Even, even if you are not utilizing GPUs, it's still more beneficial to concatenate them and apply together because then on CPU, you might be able to leverage some um, the matrix optimization. Okay, so you, you basically concatenate them and then you apply the nonlinear activation. Usually um, this is, well, you use uh, this uh, sigma symbol to indicate the nonlinearity, but then uh, it is possible to actually use, um, I mean, it's not possible. It's, it's really more often to use 10H. I told you about this, right? So you can think of this 10H usually. And then that's how you get the HT. And then you use the output of 10H and then apply some uh, another linear function. And also possibly if it's going to next layer, then sometimes you apply another non-linear non activation to um, get the output. But um, to be honest, usually, this part is not really considered um, part of RNNs. Um, you, will, you can just think of this part uh, as being the RNN, the other part. When people say RNN. Okay. So how, did I, how, did I, how does it compare to the, the LSTM unit we we're talking about? So it, it, it looks much more complicated, but then actually, um, it's actually simple than it, it seems. So let's actually dissect one by one. All right, so um, what is gating mechanism? The gating mechanism is basically, an, a, uh, it's a, well, it's a neural network that allows you to pass information from previous hidden state selectively, depending on, situation and there is a question um, when people say use the output of RNN do they usually mean the hidden state or the actual output state 
Um, yeah, it's actually a good question. So first of all, I don't think there is a single answer because especially um, I think the, the history of Ireland is very short that people interpret it in a very different ways. So I don't think there is a single, single right answer. But then if I were asked the question, I would interpret it as um, using the hidden state. And there, you, because usually RNNs um, uh, having an, uh, separate output states is not really common. So it's really the case that the, using the hidden state as the output is really more, more common. In fact, GRU also uses the hidden state directly as the output too. Well, I mean, um, in fact, in LSTM, hidden state is also the output. If you take a look at here, this is the output. It's very confusing because like, I mean, what is output hidden state or hidden state not output? Um, usually hidden state is really the output of the RNNs. And it's very not good name, right? Like, I mean, how is a hidden state output that it's not hidden, right? You can think of this as a more of a the state itself. I mean, hidden is probably not really important um, word. Uh, the state of the RNN. That's what you use, you use for the output. All right. So, how do how do you do that? So, first of all, we first want to find a few common parts. Okay. So. You can see that there is a uh, it's like this sigma g, sigma c. So what are these? Uh, sigma g refers to sigma gate. So sigma gate is essentially you want to actually create a um, gating well values that is will be deciding whether the previous value is passed or not. And because you're multiplying this ft to something, then you can guess that, well, then probably this has to be either zero or one, right? Because if it's zero, then you're, you're actually um, forgetting everything from the previous, previous states, ct minus one. And if t is one, then you're actually bringing everything from the previous state. So, but then of course we're using neural network, which should be differentiable instead of a binary like zero one. So we want the value to be between zero and one. Um, then if, you, if your gate wants to be between always zero and one, then what function should you use? It's quite obvious, right? We learned about this. It should be sigmoid. I mean, the, uh, this function, right? And it's 0 0.5, it's sigmoid. So that's why you use sigmoid for gating functions. So this is um, sigma g, and it's actually corresponding to all of these functions. And the way that they are computed is exactly the same. It's just except that the, the parameters that are multiplied to each input or the previous hidden state is different. And naming is quite obvious too, right? They use F for F, I for I, O for O. Um, F refers to the forget, I refers to input, and O refers to output. But then the way that they're computed is exactly the same. So it's, you, you, they, ref, they are referred as forget gate, um, input gate, or input modulation gate. Um, well, I mean, it's not input modulation gate, my bad. So it's input gate, yeah. And then um, output gate, okay? <clears throat> and then after that, well, after you have computed FI and FIOT and FI and O, then you also have this the same uh, function as the recurrent neural network, which is the this one. It, it's exactly the same, right? And the, the sigma C is actually 10H here. So exactly the same. 
as the RNN. So that's it. It's it's good to see what the what's common between the LSTM RNN first, so that it's easier to understand what's different. Then, well, then how do you compute the next CT? If it was an RNN, then next CT is just the CT of the T. But then it's different in that, well, you have this now gate coming into play. And it's quite interesting how this gate works. Because as I said, if forget is actually high, that means then you, it's actually also the other way. If forget is high, then it means it, it's, not, it's not forgetting. It's actually bringing everything um, from previous hidden state or previous memory state, more, to be more exact. The C is actually referring to memory state. And if I is high, that means then you're bringing everything from the current memory state candidate, which is C tilde. So it is designed to be, well, um, it's actually controlling the how, how much you pass from the previous state and how much you pass from the, uh, the current input separately. And in fact, what GRU does is that actually um, it has only one gate so that it doesn't um, pass both at the same time, or it doesn't actually forget both at the same time. Um, just that's the difference between LSTM GRU. And then um, just for some reason, for some random reason, after you have this CT or the T, um, CT, in more state, you actually apply some another 10H on top of that. This is 10H. And, and then you apply this output gate so that you also have another controlling for the hidden state. So actually, um, we have a fresh page to um, to have a summary. So again, we first compute these gates, and this is uh, equivalent to RNN. Um, so and then you basically have a uh, um, where the the important gating mechanism in action. And this is just like a, a additional layer with some gating. And it's, it's I'm not really sure, um, well, if this is really useful, um, well, having a gate at the end. So, because I mean, it just means that whether you want to pass something or not, uh, but still, I mean, that was how LSTM was designed initially. But conceptually, I think what really but the really important thing is this part because uh, the gating mechanism, the concept of gating mechanism has been used so often after that um, until actually I think the residual connection really took over the everything. Um, it started from uh, ResNet in the image domain and then um, it went into Transformer 2. Oh, the question is uh, where is CTL the computer in the architecture? You mean the in this in this uh, diagram? Hmm. Maybe this diagram is not accurate. <laughs> I never looked into this diagram uh, really closely. I actually copied this from this web. It's funny, actually. Yeah, this is supposed to be. Um, let me see. Mm. Okay, I think in this case, they are calling this GT. That's my guess. So here, uh, they're calling um, GT, same as CTLA. So there are several ways to call this. And then um, then it makes sense, right? Because um, now you're, you compute this C tilde here, and then you put the input gate. And then you actually add that with the previous hidden states uh, 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 multiple by by the forget gates. Yeah, so I think GT is the C tilde here. Um, okay, the other question, just to confirm, the gates are sigmoids, but can be replaced with 10H. Well, if they are, then it doesn't really serve the purpose, right? Because the purpose of the gate is that it, they have to be sometimes ignored. Uh, if the model chooses to. And the way that model can ignore them is by making the gate value zero, right? But then 10H, the, if you saturate them, it's either negative one or one. And you might ask, but then still the 10H goes through 
zero. So why can't 10 h replace sigmoid? And the reason is that, well, neural networks models usually try to saturate in some real number. And because of that, the 10 h, it's really hard to um, have the number close to zero. And actually there are very few real numbers whose output will be close to zero in 10 h. But then how about in sigmoid? Well, there are almost infinitely many numbers that can be uh, close to zero in sigmoid because like if you have any number that's below like negative five, then it will be, it's sigmoid will be close to zero. So it's actually, um, it can saturate to zero much easily, um, much more easily. And that's why sigmoid is more preferred. Okay, so I think now you understand how this LSTM works. And another thing is that uh, probably you will also do this um, in the lab or maybe not, but then uh, it's good to know if you want to compute this efficiently, um, the most computations happen in this multiplication. So you want to actually parallelize that. And how can you parallelize this easily? Well, by um, the easiest way is that you just actually uh, concatenate everything because this can be all um, computed in parallel, right? And you basically just concatenate the all, uh, um, wait. And like this, you get the point, right? Um, no, but so it's actually quite confusing because uh, people use the matrix complication in uh, <clears throat> um, well notations in a several different ways. Um, if this vector, then um, it's assuming it's column vector. If it's matrix, then of course it's not a column vector. So it's quite confusing, but um, it's better to actually try to understand this in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, PyTorch than um, on equation. But then the point is something like this. You do that and then, um, F prime, of course, is something that you, 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 you obtain before you apply the sigmoid or 10 H and then you just do F T equal to um, sigmoid of uh, F T prime, et cetera. And because of that, you can have this computation just done once. This is like a, a single parallel computation, just like a one operation. And then this is very fast. Then you will see that this LSTM basically have only one matrix multiplication per uh, time step. Although the matrix is quite big, right? All right, so. All right, so. <clears throat> I'll actually get water quickly, just one second. Okay, so now let's just talk about a few um, important things related to the RNNs. So um, one thing is that the RNNs is um, 
they have a direction, right? So apparently, usually it's a forward direction that the second token depends on the first token's output and this third token depends on the second token's output, et cetera. It's not the other way. And well, it's not really difficult to think about why not, um, well, I, mean, I shouldn't say it's not difficult because I think whoever thought about this for the first time should be merited. But then still, um, I think it's quite, quite um, it's not hard to understand the benefit of having bidirectional RNNs if they can be um, used. And the fact that you can concatenate or you can combine the two RNNs in both forward and backward directions. So there are several ways to really um, use these two RNNs, one forward and backward. Uh, one is token level information. Um, so in that case, then um, what you can do is that they can you can just concatenate their outputs. So it's actually um, concatenate, or sometimes actually they add. So adding will be not be changing the dimension of the uh, output hidden state, right? You just add them. Um, you can concatenate and then the output of this um, RNN will be double the size of the output of the just single direction RNN. And I think this diagram just tells you that it, well, it doesn't really tell you what this is. Is it add or concatenate, but then still it actually happens, right? Some, some, some sort of a, um, aggregation happens and it, it's your just choice. Sometimes it's, um, well, better to do adding, sometimes better to do concatenation. I don't think there is a really clear uh, winner, but then I think I did concatenation more when I used to use RNNs. It's just because um, I thought that the information is less lost, but then it's not always true anyway. So um, I don't think there's an answer. Um, again, um, if it's actually more common these days to add because um, people don't want to actually change dimensions and adding is usually not too bad. So it's if you do adding then, well, in this case, it's not really ratio dual, but then um, you can basically think of this similar to doing the ratio dual connection. Um, if you do text level information, sometimes you concatenate the last output of the forward and the last first output backward. But this is very uncommon these days, especially because um, you will see this in your assignment too. Uh, well, if you just use the last output, and first output, of course, is also last, right? Because um, it's backward. And that, again, I told you that you're going through a lot of layers, and that means not only, well, it has to be, I mean, it has, it's going through a lot of uh, corruptions because you're applying a lot of layers on top of that, even if you have a gating mechanism. It, it's very, it's just more difficult to train the model because um, the gradient will be flowing through a very um, short, very, very narrow and also very long pipeline. And it's always bad. It's always best, best to um, have a several ways the gradients flow for your all parameters that's, that's something that people have learned for the last, I think, five to 10 years. So uh, in general, uh, if it's possible, then it's always good to connect somehow uh, a lot. Not just like, uh, you know, bottlenecking everything in a sequential manner. But it's worth noting because um, people have used this a lot in the initial um, deep learning age, especially like, um, like 2015, something like that, 2014, 2015, 2016-ish. Another application of RNNs is that you can stack several RNNs. It's similar to, well, bidirectional in that you have multiple RNNs, but difference is that in the bidirectional, still there in parallel, the two RNNs, forward and backward, but then in multi-layer RNNs, of course, one is on top of the other. But then um, instead of just stacking, again, it's, good to consider adding the input to the output. So this is called residual connection and it's very common these days, but again, it was not back then. So, okay, what the, it's not working. Okay, good. So when, when, when I say residual connection, then um, basically, for instance, um, this gets added to here this gets added to here and this gets added to here. I mean, yeah. yeah. 
it's a very simple thing. We'll, we're going to also cover this in the um, uh, lab session. When we talk about dropout briefly, I think I missed a few important things. So I'm bringing this back again. So I, I, I told you that the dropout is randomly dropping each value with a fixed probability of P during training phase. And P usually ranges from 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. And the during inference, you do not apply dropout. So what that means is that um, we should upscale the outputs by one over one minus P during training for the same expected value. Because if you actually try to compute the expectation, then it will drop during training. In other words, if that was trained um, on that scale, then uh, it's, it's usually the the output value will be smaller than uh, they should be. So that's why we actually upscale that by one over one minus P during inference time for the same expected value. And dropout is an effective regularization. Um, so as I've told you last time, it's often used not just in NLP or image, but then um, in very many domains and still in, in RNNs, um, it was like one of the most dominant ones and in transformer they're still used. So it's something that you will always probably um, live with. Okay, so I think I spent too much time on the uh, the first part, which was supposed to be, I think, um, around, uh, yeah, like 10 minutes, but I spent like, I think, 40 minutes. So we just basically covered up to here, um, sentiment classification, um, text classification, RNNs, and vanilla learning. Well, I mean, I'm going to talk about what learning means can forget about this for now. But then, well, we talk about RNNs and we talk about text classification. And uh, well, one of the task examples is sentiment classification, although there are a lot of uh, text classification. And today we're gonna cover uh, token classification and retrieval. This has to go up here. So I'm gonna be a bit uh, fast, um, well, but still I think I was going to, uh, make this class short. So uh, I'm gonna go without break, okay? Just to um, have a shorter class trying to. It'll be relatively, um, well, a lot of slides, but hopefully brief. So what is token classification? So it's also called, also known as sequence tagging. So in text classification, you classify the entire text into categories, right? So it's either sentiment or some other uh, queries. So the question is, can you use wrap out during inference to simulate in ensemble models? No, I mean, um, you're, if you use dropout during training time, it's simulating ensemble models because, uh, well, but then during inference, it's not really ensemble because, um, how should I explain this? <clears throat> You're just dropping information, right? So it's not really ensemble uh, if you do during, during inference time. During training time, it, it's kind of, um, well, ensemble because you are trying to find a um, good configuration that satisfies, and you, are, you are trying to find a parameter or I mean, a set of parameters that satisfy slightly different configurations of the model due to random dropout. And that, that different configuration, each configuration can be considered as a different model. And that's why people call um, dropout as kind of ensemble, mo ensemble models during training time. But then in inference time, if you actually do dropout, it just, uh, that dropout is being applied to that exact, exact example, right? And that means it just, uh, losing some information that it, it might need. So no, um, as far as I know, I don't think dropout will be used during inference um, in any case. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, we can run the model multiple times. Um, well, so let's see. Yeah, I mean, first of all, 
it, I'm very, it's very good discussion. This is really good discussion. So let's try to think through this. Um, you were saying that um, <clears throat> if the mo model is run, run uh, multiple times, then then the uh, and with the like different dropouts in inference, right? But then first of all, well, during inference, um, one thing I want to make sure is that um, during inference, there is um, really very rare, but if, uh, if not uh, non, like, so basically you can think of it as like, a, there is no reason that you want to introduce any sort of uh, uncertainty during inference time. Because um, inference, there is no reason not to make it deterministic. So if you're talking about um, combining some multiple, uh, you're running multiple models with a different, um, well, dropout, which means you're dropping different um, nodes each uh, run of the model, then there should be a, a way to actually make it fully deterministic. And I believe that, well, I think it's not too hard to see that probably that that model that you're uh, resulting in is actually, it's not necessarily better than, um, well, the model that you started with. So, but then it, it, it is true that the ensemble itself is very helpful in general. So, well, and then, so I think it's, it's better to think of the other way. The inference is always uh, has to be deterministic and um, that deterministic behavior can be determined by multiple models trained in a different environments, right? And that different environments basically is induced by dropout because it's actually inducing some randomness, but then it, it, it's not the other way that you're uh, actually inducing some randomness during the first time. So I'm not sure I was clear, but um... And the question um, about the, the during inference. So it means that during inference is because when we're uh, training models, uh, we are training models because um, we want to use that during, um, well, after you have trained model then your parameters are fixed, right? And then you now apply this function for your use case, your products, right? If it's sentence classification, then you're using model to classify the sentiments of the, um, of the uh, documents. So in that case, then the uh, then you're uh, doing it during inference. Um, so okay. So also we can utilize uncertainty if output with different alpha but differs a lot. Yeah, but then um, that that difference is um, you're saying. So I think what you're saying is that you're thinking about inducing uncertainty in the, uh, during inference time. And that, that can actually, they might be able to um, have some uh, performance improvement, right? So, well, so I, I think my, my short answer is no. Um, well, so, but then I'll see if, it, if I might be wrong, I mean, maybe there is a reason, but then in general, my rule of thumb is that um, there is very um, few reasons, if none at all, that you will need some uncertainty during the first time. Um, so it's actually sometimes confusing because um, training time, you're inducing a lot of uncertainty and the, in the inference time now, you're saying, oh, you don't need uncertainty. You, you, don't, you don't want uncertainty at all. And actually that's true because you can think of this as, um, well, there are several ways to think about this. One way is that, um, well, one way to think about this is that the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the, the inference time is basically the, um, the statistics of the training time, which means training time is some, um, 
you know, it has a lot of randomness. That's why you have distributions and everything. And after that, you have um, some statistics and statistics of uh, some uncertainties always, uh, they are fixed, right? I mean, if you have uh, some distribution, its mean value is fixed, right? So even if you have uh, some uncertain, uncertain distribution, its statistics is fixed. And you can think of um, inference time as uh, the resulting statistics of some uncertain behaviors during, uh, during training time. I mean, that's one way to think about it. And that's why, um, that's one way to uh, explain why in during inference time, there is no really reason to make it uncertain anything. I think we can discuss a bit more, hopefully in the lab session, um, if you have more questions. And it, it is actually possible that maybe there's something that I'm missing. That's a really good answer, yeah. So um, I think uh, Yongna did a pretty good job of, uh, I think, um, organizing what I was trying to say. So yeah, so basically um, how the ensemble works is exactly how you uh, really turn off the dropout during inference time, because um, it's uh, during training time, you're basically operating different configuration, but then in each um, dropout values that you're just only seeing one configuration, right? of the parameters. And then if you just uh, turn off all the dropout during your first time, then it basically becomes the ensemble of the, all the uh, configurations. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we're running really out of time. So I think what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna just cover the one more uh, part. So we were actually talking about the five things to talk about today. And really, what the really this this was really the important one because um, um, you need this to do your assignment. So we did this. Uh, okay. My gosh, this doesn't work. Yeah, this pen sucks. All right, so we did LSTM, and then uh, we're gonna just cover um, token classification, and we're gonna end the class a bit sooner today um, at ten a.m. All right, and you you now know everything you, you need to do your assignment one. So at least that was my purpose. Um, I mean the minimum I wanted to achieve. Okay, so how about the we we're talking about text classification, but then um, now we want to talk about token classification and what is different from text classification. Well, in text classification, you classify the entire text into categories, right? E.g. sentiment classification. And in token classification, um, what you're classifying is not the entire text, but then you're classifying each token of the text. So, so I think the, when you're hearing these things, the first thing you want to uh, ask yourself is that first, why are you, why, why would you do it? Like, is there any useful usefulness to this? And number two is that, um, how do you do this? Note that this is also called a sequence tagging. So if you heard a sequence tagging, then you can think of it as uh, almost the same thing as token classification. So let's talk about why you would do it. So there are several reasons. So one reason is that you want to classify really the, each word. And when do you want to classify each word? Um, maybe when you are actually trying to analyze its grammatical structure. Then, then we want to analyze, classify each word into whether it's a determiner, it's whether um, some adjective, um, it's whether it's some um, noun, verb, etc. Right? It's called part of speech, by the way. So you want to assign or you want to determine what the part of speech is for each token. Then um, you might want to use some token classification model. And this task is called part of speech tagging. It's a very old task. It's been around since like 2000 or even um, actually even older in just the language domain, right? Of course, I mean, in linguistics, this has been there for like probably more than hundred years um, in the more of AI or computing uh, has been formulated as a task in recent like 20 to 30 years. Another example is named entity recognition. So probably um, part of speech is probably not so useful for um, applications because I mean, people are not really interested in uh, what the word, whether word is noun or verb. 
maybe you can use, use them to build some application on top of that. Actually, people have done that a lot, but not the application itself. But then named entity recognition might be um, more applicable because these are about really finding locations, persons, or organ organizations in the text. And these things are called named entities. And it's quite obvious why they're called named entities, right? Um, so locations like, you know, United States, Korea, um, well, or um, Seoul, Seattle, these are locations. Persons, of course, person names like Jeff Masters here, my name, Minjun. Organizations like Heist, yeah, um, or some, some organization that, of course, um, has a unique name. And the inter interesting thing here is that the, the, these are open multi word spans, not, they're not single words. So it's not um, just classifying each word into whether it's uh, either. Um, look, well, I mean, so you might be thinking what would be the best way to um, recognize these things? And there's a question. Can we consider name entity as proper noun? Um, yeah, so true. Although usually all the named entities are proper nouns, but not all the proper nouns are named entities. Um, well, that's because, of course, it, does, it doesn't mean that it's not, I mean, it, it depends on the application though, right? So if you're just looking for locations, persons or organizations, then there is a named entity, which is not, uh, I mean, there is a proper noun, which is not location, personal organization. But then even then the definition of named entity always changes. So these days, actually the definition of entity can be even broader. And in fact, actually, it's more accurate to say this way. Um, how you define the named entity is actually your choice. And what people you what people usually do is that they just um, are interested in the pro proper nouns. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Yeah, so it, 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 I think you can think of them as the same thing. Although it named entity is uh, just uh, one way that people just um, use just so that they can actually um, refer to anything they want to, instead of uh, being limited to the, the definition of proper noun that linguists use. Because I mean, if you want to name something and the linguists say it's not a proper noun, then it's very annoying, right? So you just have a, another term for that. And then, oh, we're not saying it's name, a proper noun, we're just saying it's named entity. Yeah, that's I think the uh, best way to put it. Okay, so there are several ways to um, find these named entities. Uh, one way, of course, is that you can just actually have a um, classification of each token into one of these, right? And that actually might work in most cases, but there is a, a really a big problem. And it's actually because the label, I mean, the text might have multiple spans um, from the text and they might be uh, back to back or they might be actually ad adjacent to each other. So let's give an example. So for instance, um, well, it's very rare though, right? But then let's say that you have uh, um, two people. Um, well, we have a, uh, this pen is not working. So, okay. I don't know why it's not working, but too bad I cannot write. Okay, so um, the, the what I was trying to say here is that the um, we want to label each token with um, either beginning or intermediate or others, not just um, the named entity and others. So if you just label each into either named entity or others, then um, the problem happens when two entity is adjacent. And it's, you cannot know where, where, where the boundary is between those two entities. But then when you're doing this um, name entity recognition, you want to be quite sure about the boundary. So that's why you have a beginning and intermediate. So beginning is always only assigned to the first word of the, um, the, 
uh, each named entity. So that's how you can actually differentiate be between two entities because um, you will, if you use B, then you're starting a new entity. And if it's I, then you're just continuation of the, from the previous token. Um, then if you, uh, and by the way, but it's called biotagging because beginning intermediate other tagging, or sometimes it's actually called IOB tagging. So if you hear, uh, see this in the papers, then you can think of them as the same thing. And it's not always used for named entity, right? Because um, you might be also trying to extract something else from the text, which is span and it can happen multiple times, which is not, not, not a an named entity or not a proper noun. It depends on your application. So if you want to design a model for biotagging, then your input will be tokenized sentence and your output will be um, token level three-way probably distribution, right? Because it's classification, but now no more classification on the, on, on the text itself, but then you're actually doing the um, token level classification. And the loss will be the average of the cross entropy for every token. So you're basically thinking of, you can think of this as you're solving multiple classification problems in one text at the same time. And model, well, I think, why not use bidirectional LSTM? Because LSTM probably is better than RNNs. You heard about, about that and, uh, in this lecture. And then why not bidirectional? Because probably we have dependency in both ways. And anyway, we want to do token level classification. So we want to make sure that um, at each time step, we have some dependency on either direction. OK, so we're going to end here. Um, so one reason, of course, is that my pen is not working, so it's very annoying. Oh, actually, it's not working now. But um, yeah, uh, I think it's good to end here. And so we're going to end the class a bit sooner today. And I think um, we're going to cover the other three parts um, in, uh, in the next lecture, which, which will happen in next Tuesday. Um, and then we're going to be going through some lab session on Thursday. And I think the lab session on Thursday will be important for many of you, especially if you're working the, on the assignment. It'll be a good time for uh, you to actually um, um, ask for help to me or TAs and also uh, learn a few things um, that you might not be, um, well, convenient with at, uh, at the moment because you're taking maybe this class um, for the first time. I mean, what I'm saying is that you haven't taken a lot of deep learning classes. So please utilize the lab session as well. Um, and I will end the uh, class today and I will see you on Thursday in the lab session. Okay, thanks a lot.